I hope after the last presentation you're a little bit relaxed. Uh, we've had some rather serious talks this morning, which is great. Uh, I love some of the things we've talked about this morning. Um, I want to get a little bit of audience participation. Uh, I know that that's a little bit uh, non-standard, uh, but I do want to ask a couple questions to see uh, how much you all understand what I'm talking about today. So, quick question. Who in here in their daily life, in their work life, uses a computer? <laughs> Pretty much given, right? I would bet that almost everyone, if not everyone, has a phone with them today, which is, in fact, itself a computer. Whether or not you're sitting at a computer at a desk or you're using one in your phone, pretty much everyone has one on them any time of day today. Technology is all around us, and I stand in front of you as a teacher in science, math, and technology. I may not look like it, I get it, for some obvious reasons, but I am a teacher, and there are many teachers here in the United States and here in this county. Our American public school system has its challenges, to say the least. You could ask pretty much anyone in this room or anyone that has ever been through that public school system, and they would have something to say about it, that they liked, that they didn't like, things they want to change, things they want to never change. I would also bet, if I asked you all, who in here has been through the American public school system? Almost all of you, right? Some of you may have immigrated from another country and didn't go through our public school system. Some of you may have been homeschooled. I myself was homeschooled uh, at different points in time in my education. You may have gone through a private school system. Uh, we have many of those here as well. But everyone here has seen our public school system or seen the products of it, students that have come out of it. And the subjects that I teach are all related to technology and the things that we interact with every day today and the things that we're going to interact with every day in the future. Some of the first things that I want to talk about so what is the technology of today? What is it that we use every day today? Whether it's phones or computers that you sit at at a desk, at work or at home, what is it we use today? Some of the things that we see in technology today, not things that you necessarily interact with, but things that are accessible to us and scientists, mathematicians, and researchers, is we have two really emerging topics. One that some people have interacted with, which is autonomous vehicles. Nowadays, more and more, we have vehicles that can drive themselves, whether it's cars, that normal everyday people use, or planes, things that are developed for the military or for commercial use that can fly themselves. We've had some rather uh, enlightening news on autonomous plane systems the last few weeks, uh, if you've heard anything about uh, those jets. And we also have genetic editing. So things that we can do nowadays to modify things that will become organisms, living organisms, and we can change how they behave and the things that they emulate uh, in their biochemistry uh, with some really interesting science today. You may have heard of CRISPR before. Uh, we hear news about it every day of how we can splice together different DNA from different animals or different species uh, and create new things. The other more recent technologies that we've seen is quantum computing. Quantum computers, I don't fully understand them myself, though I will say I am a computer scientist by trade. Quantum computers are a complex subject that have helped us develop a lot of new technologies and a lot of new algorithms in computing. Uh, for anyone who's in the computing fields, you can see the applications of quantum computing to a lot of problems that we have, and that you have, whether or not you know it, uh, in your daily lives. We also have what we call neuroprosthetics, so being able to use the brain and use brain waves to control synthetic limbs, robotic limbs. Our research in robotics and our research in how the brain works and how biochemistry in humans works has led us to be able to develop those kinds of technologies that used to be in movies alone. And the last thing we have is cybersecurity. That picture up there, some of you may have recognized it if you've ever done a tour there at the Center for Cybersecurity downtown, uh, one of UWF's multiple offices. Um, cybersecurity has become an important part of our day-to-day -day lives. And now the question is, what is the technology of tomorrow? What are we facing in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? Technology, I'd like to say one of these statistics that we've learned is that it took 68 years for 50 million people to fly jets, to use commercial airlines. It took 19 days for Pokemon Go to have 50 million users. 19 days, 68 years to 19 days, that is a huge gap in the time it took for 50 million people to adopt a new technology. And we can consider air travel a technology. So what is the technology of tomorrow? What are we going to be facing here even in the next year? Some of those technologies, you may have seen Sophia the talking robot before. She's an intelligent AI robot. Like I said, our, our research in robotics and in computing have combined and created things like this. And we're about to get to that point where we have what we call artificial general intelligence. Another one is terraforming. You may not think of it as something we can do today, and we really can't, 
but we do want to look in the near future of terraforming other planets to be like Earth. We have looked especially at Mars. You've probably heard those conversations before, too. We want to take other planets and make them habitable for when you reach a point here on Earth that we can no longer sustain the people that we have here. Another one we have is exploring exoplanets, planets outside of our solar system. We already know of a bunch of those that exist. We've sent out probes into deep space to find out any more. We also think about cloning. Cloning is a really interesting subject. We can do it. We've done it with other animals, not humans quite yet. We've done it with other animals, and that's where our genetic research now, with being able to edit organisms, will come into play. And lastly, we'll have full-on cyber war, what we call war in the fifth domain or the fourth domain, depending on who's counting. You think of the military domains we have now, ground, sea, air, space is where you may or may not have a fourth domain, and nowadays we have cyber. Cybersecurity, while it's important to all of us in our daily lives, is even more important to our national security. We have entire buildings, entire offices, entire wings of our military in every country that are focused entirely on computers and cyber war. And that is in our next few years as a future as well. So what do we need to prepare people to work in these fields? These are very complex subjects. Many of you may not have that kind of technical expertise to go into one of these fields. I won't admit to having it either. The workforce for technology is very educated. But 99% of STEM-employed workers have some kind of higher education, whether it's some amount of college, an associate's degree, two years equivalent, or all the way up to a PhD. 99% of our STEM workforce has some kind of higher education degree, and a very, very small sliver of them do not. Our workforce is also going to be much more dynamic than it is now. About 48%, based on expert opinions, about 48% of jobs that exist now will be lost to technology, primarily automation. Think things like robotics and manufacturing. Many of our factories now don't have any people in them anymore. They're all machines. Many of our jobs, many of our desk jobs, any kind of office administration, any kind of system administration is now done by computers for the most part. We've automated a lot of paper processes. The more we move to computers, the more we can turn them into automated jobs. Any of the technologies that I mentioned at the beginning are things that we need people to be ready to do now. And about 87% of people don't have any experience to go into those fields or to meet that new workforce need. So 87% will need training. Our workforce is also unprepared. About 47% of teachers don't think they have the resources to learn how to teach these things to their kids. About half of our school system. 47%, that means one in two students in the American public school system has a teacher with the kind of resources to teach them how to do this kind of technology, which will essentially replace all the workforce now. That's a pretty daunting statistic. We're not ready to train the workforce of tomorrow yet. But 79% of executives, so looking away from school, but looking towards the workforce and what they need, about 79% of executives, CEOs at large companies, think that we don't have the skills being trained in schools for the workforce that they're going to need in 10 years. They're also underserved. 17% of teachers, so think about one in five teachers in this country, have a second job. Not only that, but 53% of our students nowadays are minority groups. 53%. So we now have a majority of minority students. And that's a lot of kids that need representation to feel like they can become a part of that technology workforce, or a part of the workforce at all. But 80% of our teachers are not. So what do we need? How do we address this problem? What are, what are the skills that we need in order to get there? Critical thinking is one of the skills that we need, right? We need to be able to understand the context of a problem. We need to be able to identify the problem in that context. And we need to be able to determine the cause. What are the root reasons for that problem? We also need problem solving. We need to know how to pick that problem and then define the goal. What is it that we want to change about that problem or about that context? Find what possibilities you have to implement that change and then formulate a plan to actually enact and solve that problem. Creativity is something we want as well, which is defining the needs, the needs for that plan, what you need to do in order to enact it. You can express that mission and that vision in a way that is not purely technical. You can express it creatively. And designing a solution, if we think about any type of engineering, which is something that I teach to a lot of kids, 
There's a lot of creativity involved with that. When we creatively create a solution, that's great, but then you actually have to do it. You can sit around and think about a plan to solve a problem all day, but if you don't do anything with that plan, you're not going to solve that problem. So applying it requires a set of skills as well, which is being able to gather those resources to implement that, that plan or to create that design. To be able to produce the result that you want, making some, whether it's a physical solution or a change in a system. And the last skill that we need is we need purpose. You may not think of it as a skill, but we talk a lot about type A and type B people, right? Type A people being those that are driven, have a purpose, and they want to accomplish something. And they're, they're like that all the time. They're energetic, right? And we talk about type B people, people who don't seem to have a clear purpose, or they're not moving in one single direction, and they want to move in multiple. So what do we need to do? What do we need to create in order to instill those skills in the future workforce? First of all, we need to engage. There's five steps in this process, and they all start with ease. Made it easy to remember. The first step is to engage. Using hands-on activities, something that our children are especially fond of. Up to a certain developmental age, you want hands-on learning. You don't want to sit through a lecture and take notes and watch videos sometimes. You want that hands-on learning. So you need some kind of activities that they can physically interact with. Our second step is to experience. We want to tie that engagement to an experience that you will use as a member of the workforce or to get into one of these careers. We want to find some way to tie whatever it is that you did in the classroom to the real world. That's a challenge we have in teaching a lot. And that's what we need to implement in order to get us part of our pipeline to getting these students into the workforce. Once they've done whatever it is you're trying to teach, and once you've tied it to the real world so they know they can continue to do that as a job, as a career, you need to encourage them. Give them positive feedback. Recognize small incremental goals. If there's some small step in the process that results in something that they can be proud of, you should point that out. Because they can do the activities, and you can tie it to the real world and show them that they could do it if they wanted to. But if they don't see any reward in it, what's the purpose? And that's where we establish some of that purpose. Provide students with resources, not just in the classroom, but outside of it as well, that they can continue to pursue the things that they find interesting. The things that, through that feedback loop, they have found to be something worthwhile doing and learning and specializing in. Even when they get to middle schools nowadays, we have vocational academies that train students for particular jobs, and they will continue to train for that throughout their college education if they need to go to college, in the case of some technical fields where they don't. So we need to encourage them to pursue opportunities, to explore those ideas, those concepts, and those careers that they find interesting. And our final step is to empower them. Empower them to do that. Don't just provide them the resources and the tools. While that's great and that's a good starting point, they need a little bit of passion. They need someone to show them how to be driven to do it. They need to be shown, here's what you can do if you continue to do this. So here's a case study. Here's where I specialize. So a little bit more on my background to explain why I'm a teacher. I've taught robotics for a number of years. I was in the robotics, a couple robotics programs in my time uh, back in elementary, middle, high school. I started then volunteering for those robotics programs. I started getting more heavily involved in the STEM network around here, the STEM education community. And I started coaching teams even, leading teams from starting point with no technical skills to competing in a regional stage the program that I'm talking about is Inertia. Inertia is a program we started about two years ago. And what we do in this program is we implement those five steps, the first of which being to engage. Everything that we do, we go to schools, third through fifth grade primarily, and we engage students with hands-on STEM, where it's not a lecture, it's not necessarily a video, it's not just explaining to them how something in STEM works, but it's actually doing it. Our next step is we bring in that experience. We tend to bring in speakers in these areas. Whether highly technical, we have a cybersecurity professional speaking here in a few weeks. We had in previous, in this, in this past year, we had a dentist present. We had actually a Navy pilot, Lieutenant Maynard. She came out and spoke just the other day at one of our schools about how to become a pilot, a helicopter pilot in particular. So we tie what they just learned in the classroom to someone who actually is doing that as a career. Our next step is to encourage them. We have constant feedback loops to our students. We actually track every time we ask five questions related to whatever it is we're talking about that day. Three of them are about at their grade level. We tie them very closely to our standards here in Florida. 
About three of them are at a grade level. One is a giveaway. One is something that is a very fundamental concept. We want to ensure that we're tracking properly, that they understand that concept as it's fundamental to everything else. And then one is a challenge question to push them, to see what they learned or what they knew when they came into our programs versus what they learn afterwards. And we try and teach them more complex subjects. Next, we encourage them to explore. We try and provide them small kits of the activities we do in the classroom that they can then go do at home and explore it a little bit more on their own. So that encourages them outside of the classroom to enjoy what they're doing. Lastly, we empower them. We build a community around these students. Education is not just a one-off system you can send students to every day and just expect that they'll come home and they've, they've magically learned something. You have to incorporate things that they're learning into their daily lives and into their communities so that they see the value in paying attention in class and learning these concepts, whether they're interested in one subject, another, none of them, or all of them. This is one of our schools. That first one was at Oakcrest Elementary, one school that we work with here. This is at Ensley, another school we work with. And then lastly, we have some of our volunteers. This is just one of our cohort of volunteers that we have each year. And we impact, all in all, a couple hundred kids a year. So what is the way forward? Now that we have a case study of how do we implement those five steps to encourage these students to pursue STEM and technology, what is the way forward? One way that you can help is to volunteer with existing programs. Community programs that are meant to help the community need the community's help to implement them. Like I said, you can come up with a great plan to solve a problem, but if you don't have anyone to actually do it, you're not going to change anything. So please, volunteer. Whether that's volunteering, which is a, maybe a one-time, two-time commitment for a short amount of time, Mentoring, which is a longer-term commitment with an individual either from that organization or one of the targets of that organization. In our case, it would be our students. And advocating, encouraging other people to participate, even if you can't. And others to collaborate. So whether that's partnerships, again, a shorter-term commitment, maybe to achieve one event or one series of events. Alliances, which are usually multiple organizations that band together to make something happen and to push a campaign. Lastly, to invest. Donating personally, even a couple dollars, through the drive-thru, if, if you so choose. Every time you get one of those little cards or, or they ask you when you check out, would you like to round up? It's 12 cents. Sure. Why not? It really does make a difference. And one more category is connecting. Whether that's referring people to that organization and saying, you should really check out this organization. They do great work in whatever area. So those are the ways that we implement programs that work in our public school system. Inertia has been a great experience for me. I've loved the last two years. I love being a co-founder. I love sitting on the board. I love being in the director of impact role where I go out and teach these students and get to witness how they're learning. So please, take some of the tips and some of the steps that I've encouraged today and implement them when you can. Donating, volunteering, collaborating, connecting. It really makes a difference and it allows community organizations to try and prepare our students for the future. And hopefully, we won't have so many more complaints about our public school system. Hopefully, we can solve some of those challenges. Thank you guys very much for your time.